Thank you everyone for coming and joining us on this um, academic panel. We are so happy to have you. And um, I'll start off by introducing myself. I'm going to be the moderator in this panel. My name is Gianna, my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm a junior in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, double majoring in political science and history. Um, and I'm originally from Miami, Florida, which is where I am right now. I'm going to be heading back to Boston later today. Um, and I'll start off by just talking about a few of my experiences and my favorite courses so far. I would have to say a favorite course of mine um, has to be Courage to Know. It's this class that's open to freshmen, and it's just a way for you to connect with your peers, um, peers you wouldn't have in other classes since it's a capstone. And you're just able to talk about your experience in college so far and how it is transitioning, which, you know, everyone has their ups and downs their freshman year and it really was such an eye-opening experience. And my professor has been an advisor for me for the next you know, last three years of my career and has made such a difference. Another class of mine that I love is also open to freshmen. It was an enduring questions course. And it's basically a course that BC offers that allows two different professors from different fields to talk about a common topic. And it was so eye-opening because I had a science professor and a history professor, um, you know, I don't like science, so I took it as a way to get um, done with my science core, but it ended up being such an amazing experience for me that allowed me to see how much I loved history, and now I'm majoring in it. So it really changed my path for the better, and I loved it. Highly recommend you taking Courage to Know or an Enduring Questions course or both during your freshman year. It makes such a difference. But that's just a little bit about me. I also have my email in case you want to reach out about anything I've talked about so far but I can go ahead and hand it over to the amazing panelists we have today. Um, I'll start it off with handing it over to a professor we have. Um, Anya, you could go ahead and take it away. Hi everybody, um, thanks for being here. Um, my name is Anya Villatoro and I am the Assistant Director of Undergraduate Academic Services for the Cannell School of Nursing. Um, I have she series pronouns and um, let's see, in terms of, um, the School of Nursing, I oversee the first year nursing seminar, which is a unique um, thing to the nursing program. It's small group based and run by junior and senior leads. Um, and we have uh, speakers from across the university that I help coordinate to kind of help get connections made for nursing students and understand the lay of the land at BC. Um, and I'm originally from Southern California, so I'm um, excited to, to meet any prospective students that are coming from the West Coast. I'm just going to hop in here also. I forgot to mention, um, feel free to flood the chat with any, uh, well, actually the Q&A feature because the chat's table, just any questions that you have for the panelists and we'll go ahead and, and give it off to the panelists to answer. Um, I think Tiff is next for intros. Hi everyone, my name is Tiff. I'm currently a senior here at BC. Um, I'm from Bristol, Rhode Island, and I am in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences with a major in psychology, Bachelor of Science, and a double minor in theater and marketing. And a class that was really formative in my BC experience would probably have to be um, the class I took my freshman year. Um, it was one of the um, core curriculum uh, uh, classes that combined two different uh, types. So. It was an enduring questions class and so I took a, a history class and a political science class um, and it was called the history and politics of terrorism and it was a really informative class you know one of my um, goals coming into BC was to be more aware about what was going on in the world and so I was able to uh, take an issue out the world and look at it from an historical and a political uh, science um, lens and it was definitely something that was a really interesting experience and I learned from some great professors who have like already published books on this topic and a whole bunch of other things so it was a really great experience and I'm very grateful uh, to have had that my first year at BC. Thanks, Tiff. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Zhang. Um, I'm also a senior here at Boston College. I'm originally from Linfield, Massachusetts, which is around 40 minutes north of BC in the North Shore area. Um, I'm in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, majoring in economics with minors in philosophy and finance from our Carroll School of Management. Um, one of my favorite classes that I've taken at BC is a class I took sophomore year called Pulse. So Tiff touched on it a bit, but BC has a core curriculum that 
uh, spreads across 10 different disciplines, 15 different courses. And two of the core requirements that we have to take before we graduate are philosophy and theology. So Pulse is a year long course that combines your philosophy and theology core. And what's unique about it is that half of the class, uh, half of the course is your traditional classroom portion. You learn a lot of, uh, about philosophy, you learn a lot about theology, you learn some social justice issues as well. And then the other half is actually you spend uh, eight to 12 hours a week volunteering in the neighboring Boston area. So I got placed at Bird Street Community Center, which is an after school program in Dorchester. And I spent time with the kids, helped them with homework, um, spent time with them, served as a mentor. And you really get to see a lot of the social justice issues that you learn in class come into fruition in the real world. So that's definitely been not only one of my favorite classes, but one of my favorite experiences at BC so far. Thank you so much for sharing, Nick. It was great. Um, hi, guys. My name is Michaela Sanchez. I am a sophomore in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences, double majoring in history and sociology and minoring in management and leadership. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm originally from Berkeley Heights, New Jersey, which is kind of central northish. Um, and one of the one of my most favorite classes, if not my favorite class I have taken at BC up until this point, is the introduction to Latin American societies class, which I took my freshman year. I had I wasn't really planning on taking this class. I was trying to bump out other core curriculum requirements um, coming in freshman year. But my advisor was like, this course is great. The professor is amazing and it fulfills your cultural diversity requirements. So I was like, okay, that sounds something like something I'd be really interested in taking. So I ended up taking it and I loved it immediately. We covered so many different topics from economics in Latin American countries to sociological issues, political issues, cultural issues, so many things that were combined into one class. And I knew from that class that my eyes were open to the sociology major. And I had originally come in intending to be a political science major, but I took a class, didn't love it as much. And I took this one and I just went up to the professor one day after class, Professor Gustavo Morello, who has been one of my mentors now. And I was like, I really like your class. Is there anything else that you're teaching? Do you recommend the sociology? major and we actually ended up talking from there. He would email me a couple weeks later and ask me if I wanted to be part of undergraduate research in the sociology department, which is something I never thought I could be involved in, especially since I'm not really into science. I didn't know research was an opportunity that could be for me. And it was really great to have my eyes open, not only to pursuing a sociology major just from this one class, but for my connection with my professor, who is also a Jesuit here at BC, and getting involved in research so early on. We're finishing it up this semester, which is really exciting. We're gonna be like co-authors on the paper, which is huge. But that was definitely one of my most formative experiences so far. Awesome, so we have some questions here um, that I can start us off with. So this is probably best for um, Professor Villatoro to answer, um, but we have a question here that says, can you double major while in nursing? So that's a great question. The nursing curriculum is, is very tight. Um, I don't know of anyone who has double majored. We do have room for a minor. Um, I don't wanna say a blanket no to double majoring. Um, however, I think it would depend on either how many APs and it would have to be quite a, a few and how long you wanna be at BC if you wanna extend it a little longer in terms of how many semesters you're here. Um, but uh, we do definitely have room for minors um, as well as tons of other unique experiences within research or broad opportunities that you can be a part of as a nursing major. But I would love for you to reach out to me individually because this is more of a case by case type of answer as well. So we have another question here. Um, how much space is there for electives or other courses once major requirements in the core curriculum are taken into account? Is this also for nursing? Um, I think this is just generally. So anyone can go ahead. I, Tiff, you can, you can take it if you want. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, uh, there's a pretty decent amount of space. You do have to have a certain amount of credit, uh, credits in order to graduate, um, and that is definitely not fulfilled by just the core curriculum and your major. So, for example, my major is uh, the Psychology Bachelor of Science, and according to my, as, as far as I know, this was the major that had the most uh, credits on campus that were required. I think it was coming in at like 59, 69 credits, something like that. Um, and I still had the opportunity to complete my core curriculum and have a 
minor in marketing, did take theater classes and be on the pre-med track. Um, so there's definitely a lot of space. Um, if you are interested in adding on a minor, you can do that, I believe, at any point. And minors are, at least in the Carroll School of Management, my minor is only six classes, so it's really easy to fit into your schedule. And then, if, so if I didn't, if I wasn't on the pre-med track and I still had, and I had the marketing minor, but didn't do the pre-med track, I would still be able to have the major with all the requirements, the core curriculum, the minor, and I could have taken many more electives. It was just because I was on the pre-med track that I chose my electives to be those extra classes that I would take for pre-med. But in my experience, it was definitely very easy. I just like to add, uh, like Tiff said, I feel like you, you'll have a lot of room for other electives besides your major and your core classes. I think most people, most students at BC actually either double major or co-concentrate or have a minor. So you have a lot of room. And what's great about the core at Boston College is that um, if you take some of the core classes and you have interest in a discipline, it's really easy to add the minor or the major onto that. Like I took the philosophy core and I really liked it. And there's, you only have to take four extra classes to get the minor. So like you're already like one third of the way there, which is really great. So I think that's something that's really useful and, and something to keep in mind at your time at BC. Awesome. So there's another question we have in. Has the core curriculum helped you declare your major? Yeah, I think I touched on this a little bit before, but um, I didn't have any sociology classes that were offered to me at my high school. And like I said, I came in as a political science major, so I knew I had to fulfill the social um, the social curriculum um, in that way through the core curriculum. So taking those classes weren't a waste in any way. They really helped me investigate whether or not I wanted to continue the political science major or if I wanted to switch over to sociology. And in, in addition to that, I also took history for one of my core curriculum requirements. And I realized I really enjoyed that as well. So I think the core curriculum opens you up to different classes that you might not have forced yourself to take. You might be coming in thinking that you're going in this one path direction and you know exactly what you're going to do, but then required to take a core curriculum and you're like oh maybe I don't want to take this or I'm not sure if I'll, this will interest me and then once you're in it you realize maybe this is something that you need to pursue and completely um completely get rid of the idea that you had coming into college so I think the core curriculum really helps you push you out of your comfort zone and allows you to experience things that you might not have experienced in high school so by taking that introduction to Latin American societies class I took the introduction to sociology the next semester and that kind of solidified the fact that I wanted to pursue a sociology major so I would say the curriculum core curriculum definitely helps a lot with that. Awesome um, I think this would help a lot of students um, you know that are curious about college life that are tuning in um, what would you say walk us through an average weekday. What can a student expect in college um, as a prospective student right now? I can take that one. That was something that I loved about college is that, you know, like in high school, you usually go to school 7.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. straight. That's when all my classes are. But in uh, college, I had so much freedom to be able to choose when I want my classes. And I would definitely recommend choosing classes when you are most productive. So if you are not a morning person, do not schedule an 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. class because you're not gonna go and you end up paying for those classes. So definitely get your money's worth. Um, but also it'll just help you learn better if you are definitely like, if you are very productive in the morning, get all your classes done. And then, so you have the rest of the day to kind of do whatever you want. And that's kind of how I did it. Um, so really, I think the average day depends on the student and what type of learner they are. So for example, freshman year, I had class 8 a.m. to 11 a.m. Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And then I think I had class 9 a.m. to 12.45 p.m. on Tuesday, Thursdays. And then after that, I would have time to do my homework. Um, and then I would go into a theater um, after school. It's like usually from 7.30 to, uh, it was like 6.30 to 10.30 every night of the week besides uh, Friday nights and Saturday nights. Um, and then, but also like my junior year, I only had classes on Tuesday, Thursday and had absolutely nothing Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, so really it just does depend on however you learn best and how you schedule your classes, but you are able to, you know, kind of like marathon your classes and have them all lined up at once. Or if you want to space them out during the day, like my roommates, for example, will have like one class and then have two hours for her next time. So she has um, the ability to, you know, hang out with friends, do some homework, grab lunch, things like that. So it really just depends on how you learn best and how you want to structure your schedule. But that's kind of how my schedule works works. Yeah, I completely agree. And I'm thinking about my Tuesday schedule now because it kind of combines a lot of things I do 
on campus. Right now we have like virtual options for classes in person, synchronous and asynchronous, like I'm sure a lot of your high schools are doing as well. So for example, on Tuesdays, I have an in-person class. I go into that at um, 10.30 to 11.45 and I'm there in class in person. And then I come back, get lunch. And then I have an online class at one from 1.30 to 2.45. So there's usually a gap that you can create between the classes, but sometimes I remember my freshman year, I was a little worried about having like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 10 to 10.50, and then like 11 to 11.50. And I'm like, I'm not gonna make it to class, but everything, once you're here on campus, you'll see that the main quad, it's super easy to go from class to class. And if you're a second late, like the professors totally understand that you're running from one to the other. Um, but on Tuesdays after my second class, I also go to work at the mission ministry office on College Road. And I think, getting a job is a great thing to do when you're going into college. I know my mom was trying to push me to do that freshman year. And I was like, I'm not gonna have enough time between school and clubs and making friends and everything like that. But I'm so grateful that I pushed myself to do it freshman year because it helped me get into a better schedule. It helps me like procrastinate less because I know I'm gonna have to be at work and also going to um, doing my homework and also seeing friends. And a lot of times, if you're like a work study student, you can do your homework during those work hours. So it's also nice to have a little bit of money to go into the city for yourself during the weekends. Awesome, thanks for sharing. Um, I have here another question. So would you say students fulfill their core during their four years or do you think students usually fill it out during a shorter timeline? I think it really depends on the student, but I feel like uh, from my understanding, most students tend to fill out a good chunk of their core, uh, like freshman and sophomore year. Um, a good amount of students do come into BC uh, undecided as a major, which is not a problem at all. We actually really encourage that if you don't know what you wanna study, because that way by taking different cores in social science and history and uh, natural science, math, so on, you can really get a wide spectrum of different disciplines and really see what you really like and you can kind of pivot from there. So I think a lot of students tend to take a good chunk of their core early, but what's good about um, Boston College is there's no like requirement, like you have to have your core done by your sophomore year. You can really space it out however you want. Um, I'm, I'm finishing out my core right now last semester senior year I left one for right now so like you it's really up to you on how you want to space it and how you want to design your own schedule awesome and this one um, is more geared toward Anya and um, you know everything that you do within CSUN so would you, what would you say are some of the academic resources within CSUN that are offered to Ohana plus students yeah, so one great program that I want to make, wanted to make sure to mention today is the Sequel Scholars Living Learning uh, Community, and this is specifically for first-year nursing students of color, um, as well as first-gen um, students. And um, essentially, you are placed in a living learning community. You don't you don't have to live together, but you do live on upper campus in Madero's Hall. Um, and you would be taking a perspectives that's uh, focused on healthcare. So it's an interesting mix, perspectives, a theology um, and philosophy course, but this one specific section is has a, a medical focus um, and pre-med students as well as nursing students are in the course. So it's an opportunity to take classes um, that are with other students outside of nursing students while also having this core community of students. Um, there's a seminar that I actually facilitate um, that's a one credit in addition to the perspectives program um, that is a lot more community focused conversations around um, identity, around transitioning uh, to college, as well as opportunities to kind of meet and greet uh, with with, um, different faculty members um, who also kind of share about their identity. So it's an interesting course um, in a lot of academic ways, but also in a lot of ways that help you to make connections and find community and reflect, which is a big part of uh, the Jesuit tradition here at BC. So that's one that I would really, really want to highlight. Um, but you asked for more resources than that. And so in addition to that course that's only for first year students, um, we do have something called the Keys to Inclusive Leadership in Nursing program. This starts 
from the sophomore year uh, through junior year. You don't have to be involved the entirety of the time, although most students are. Um, there's mentoring components, et cetera, um, with, in faculty as well as nurses um, in various hospitals. Um, so it's a great opportunity for, for connections and something that's really important in nursing, which is mentorship. Um, and we have tutoring. We've got a small but mighty undergraduate team that I like to, to, to highlight because we all have a, a very kind of open door policy. We know our students well. Uh, you're always welcome to kind of reach out, connect and chat with us. And so we really try to be a very supportive community. Um, so those are some of the things that I would highlight to start. Great, thank you. Um, I will draw your attention to the chat, Aiden. Um, sent saying um, Sabrina and you all met during the opening. She's actually an RA within this li living and learning community. So if you want to talk about, you know, what it's like from the student perspective or just some more information, definitely make sure to reach out to her. That's her email. Um, and yeah, I lived in Madeiras my freshman year. So if you decide to partake in this program, I could say Madeiras is a great dorm. <laughs> um, so I'll go ahead and open this question to any of the other students in the panel. Um, from your perspective, what do you think are some resources that would be helpful for prospective Ahana Plus students to know about? Um, I definitely think that um, the uh, the Abom Ahana Intercultural Center is a really great resources for a resource for Ahana students. Um, it's a the office that serves a lot of the Ahana students on campus. And so they'll do programming like, for example, Ahana networking, um, also cultural celebrations. Um, they'll have programming for, um, you know, like um, Black History Month and, th and things like that. Uh, so that's definitely a really good place to go. Also, you don't have to go there just for resources. They have things like uh, like an office space that you can kind of just chill there um, and just a really great space to create community and meet other Ahana students on campus. They'll also offer counseling and things like summer tuition remission. Um, so like if you ever want to take a summer class, I did that program through them. And if you qualify, um, they'll pay for your housing classes, things like that. Um, I also think another great resource um, that's not specifically for Ahana students, but I think all students should know is the Connors Family Learning Center. Um, and that's a free resource for students to use if they ever are struggling in classes. Um, and I struggled a lot in my pre-med classes, so I'm not pre-med anymore. Um, and I was able to go there um, my freshman and sophomore year while I was pre-med. And I can still go there, but I mainly use it for pre-med. And I was able to get free to tutoring and um, you know, organic chemistry, general chemistry, things like that, um, and at no cost whatsoever. And also, if you have any uh, learning disabilities uh, or you need any accommodations, you are able to go through the office as well. So for my ADHD, I can get accommodations through there. Um, so that's another really great resource as well. I think culture clubs could also be a huge resource here at BC, not only for like meeting people that share common, a common culture with you, common language with you, but also really honing in on these like academic and alumni resources. I am the director of external affairs for the organization of Latin American affairs, which is also called OLA. And right now I'm in the process of helping to lead um, five different panels called La Vision, which is um, basically an alumni networking project that we're doing and each different um, panel is a different area of professionals speaking about their experience at BC and in the real world right now. So for example, this week we have coming up our media panel and last week we had business and the week before we had law. So I think if you find like individual culture clubs or join a bunch here on campus, there's like the Black Student Forum that I know Aiden Henderson is a part of. Um, but if you find these little groups, a lot of the times they have events and networking opportunities that cater to like your specific culture group. And I think that's really cool experience because you can also meet people not only within BC, but outside as well. Awesome. So um, this next question is a bit about the social life. So what would you say a typical weekend looks like for a BC student? And we can go ahead and answer another question along with that one. How often would you say BC students visit Boston? Um, I can start on this one. I think it honestly depends on the person. I mean, there are so many different types of people at BC. Like there are people who really like to stay on campus and don't really go out. And there are people who are in the city almost every weekend and throughout the week. Um, some people go into the city for internships. I would say personally, I'm kind of in the middle. Um, BC is so close to the city. That's one of the reasons why I love BC is that the location is great because you know, like 
so close to the city, but the city is not our whole campus. Um, and I really wanted that campus feel. So I like take the T or Uber, the T is like 45 minutes, Uber is like 20, but a lot of people will go to like Newbury Street to just walk around. Um, there's like the Boston Commons, there's the aquarium. There's so much to do um, in Boston. And because Boston is a college like city, uh, they are always offering college discounts, like movie theaters, um, things like that. With COVID, of course, it's been a little bit different, um, but even with COVID, like walking around, of course, masks on and stuff um, has been something that's been really fun for me and my roommates to do. Um, but there's also so many things to do on campus, which is why some people might not go off campus. Like, honestly, sometimes there's this thing called the BC bubble, which is there's always just so much going on at BC that a lot of students don't feel the need to go out and explore the city of Boston. Um, so like, for example, like literally right outside my window right now, which is why I keep looking up, there's like a concert going on on the lawn. Um, so there's always something to do, whether it's like a concert, a cab will put on some events. Um, and even throughout COVID, of course, all the events looked a little bit different, but things are still going on. Um, there's definitely like something to do. And, uh, like Easter egg hunts, a whole bunch of things, uh, really. So whatever you like to do, I'm sure you will find something um, throughout the weekend. Yes, CAB is Campus Activities Board. I would say I go into the city probably once a week or twice a week this year. Um, we're trying to explore more. I know freshman year, I definitely stayed on campus more, but as a sophomore, I've been venturing into the city, trying different restaurants and going around there. I know my freshman year in the introduction to Latin American societies class, our final paper was about finding um, Hispanic influence within Boston. So we would have to go somewhere. I went to the Museum of Fine Arts and wrote my paper about one of the paintings there um and i know my other friend i think took globalization which is a history class and you had to have like an out of classroom experience within boston so the professors here are also willing to push you to go out of your comfort zone especially as a freshman to go into the city so from there i think once you start to get more comfortable you'll be able to navigate it easier and uber take the tea into the city whenever you feel necessary or if you want to explore with your friends Great, so um, this next question is from someone that's like a pre-med student and they wanted to know if you feel supported in your classes, particularly the larger study classes. And I think this is also a good general question too um, that you can all draw on from your experiences and um, you can also provide some insight for nursing students and you know how, how they typically feel in these larger class settings. Yeah, um, so during my time as a pre-med student, I would definitely say it's hard and challenging, but not in the sense that like other students are like stepping on you to like get where they want to be. Everybody is very collaborative or everybody's willing to help. Same thing goes for professors too. Um, what's great about the larger classes, like for example, my chemistry class and my calculus class, I think, did this. I think any class that was over 60 students broke out into a small discussion group. And the discussion groups were like 10, 15 students each, and they would meet once a week for an hour. And the discussion session is not a time to learn about new material. Rather, it's the time where you can go over questions that you may not have gotten to ask or answer in class because of that larger setting. Um, and it's ran by a TA who sits in class with you. So it's always geared towards how the professor teaches and like towards the exams things like that. And I found that really, really helpful. Um, and then you'll have labs and things like that, which tend to be smaller groups. And uh, the lab uh, proctors are always very helpful, I found. Um, and definitely go to office hours. Um, professors here are very willing to help their students. Like, um, sometimes we call them like coffee and cell phone professors because like a lot of the time like their like their cell phone number would like be on the syllabus and like if you ever need me just text me or they'll off offer to like there's a whole bunch of coffee shops like on campus and places where you can go and like their office hours will be there so you can just like kind of go up and say hi and like ask for questions and they're always willing to take out time of their day to, de uh, to like dedicate to make sure that their students are like not only succeeding inside the classroom but outside of the classroom and they really do care about you like as a whole person and they want to make sure you're succeeding academically but that you are able to you know thrive here at bc and they are very willing to help in all size classes and even in the larger classes i found that like like for my general chemistry class it was a larger class but i still knew the professor and i still went to their office hours and we still talked after class um so definitely you are able to connect with professors um throughout all the class levels I would echo everything that Tiffany said. It's applicable to nursing in terms of um, using small, brew, small group sections and labs to kind of uh, complement these larger lecture style classes. Um, but I really, really want to 
hone in on what she said about office hours. I think that that's super important um, and something that I, as a first gen student, when I was an undergrad, did it took me a while to realize how important and what office hours were even for. So I wanna highlight that that's uh, an opportunity to ask individual questions, to get feedback on your exam, to go through uh, line by line questions, to form a relationship with the professor, get to know them um, and uh, start conversations that can lead to like Michaela highlighted, perhaps opportunities for research or just mentorship. So really wanna highlight that. Unique to uh, nursing, um, we have a staff member named Brandon Huggin, who I wanna give a shout out to on here, um, who runs special study halls for first year, uh, large lecture style classes like anatomy and physiology. Um, we have something for sophomore year pathophysiology. And this is in addition to the Connors Learning Center individual tutoring um, that was highlighted earlier. So that's study skills, study set, uh, study workshops uh, through the School of Nursing would be Brandon Huggin for those that are on this call. Remember that name. That's great. And um, this kind of leads me to my next question. So how big of a role has academic mentorship played in your experiences as students or, um, you know, what have you seen mentorship as um, at BC? Um, I can start with this one. I think I mentioned before, um, Professor Gustavo Morello has been a huge um, support system for me. I know when we got sent home last year, he was one of the first people I texted to be like, are you still on campus? I want to say bye, like, because we were all like heading out um, to quarantine back in March. But I know I can like go to him and text him if I ever need anything here on campus. I also like work with him doing research. Like I said, I've been working with him like every week on like Wednesdays since my second semester of my freshman year. But also a little bit about like our advising process. When you're a freshman, you get assigned to like a random advisor, or maybe you might be in a class that comes with an advisor. So I took a freshman seminar topics class about war. So that professor, which we met with once a week, it was a one credit class, pass fail. Um, he became my advisor and he was in the history department. So he definitely swayed me to go into the history department there. But once you declare your major, which you don't have to do until second semester of your sophomore year, but I declared sociology as my main major second semester of my freshman year. So I got assigned a sociology advisor my sophomore year. And um, my advisor is Professor Eve Spangler. She's completely, she's amazing. She leads the trip to Israel and Palestine every year and focuses on social justice issues. And we became super close, like immediately we had our first meeting, which we are required to have to get our code to register for classes. And we immediately became super close. I talked to her about what I've been involved in at BC at home. I talked to her about my family life and became close through that. And I know I went, I went through the Career Center to help move my resume from being like a high school resume to a college resume. But I asked her to look over it as well since she knew me more personally than people at the Career Center. And she looked over it and she automatically like forwarded it to different like programs and scholarships here on campus that I never knew about. I think she got my foot in the door of places that I wouldn't even have known to explore. So she's been a big, huge help for me too. And I have her phone number in addition to Professor Gustavo Morello. So like Tips talked about before, it's like those coffee professors where you can just text them when you need them. And they're really looking out to help you and better you and provide any guidance that you might need. And I think that's really special because I think I was overestimating how hard it was going to be coming into um, college because I had gained these um, relationships with teachers in my high school, but it was easy because I'd known them since freshman year, had them for multiple classes, but I didn't really know how to approach college. But I think it was definitely a lot easier once you um, start having these conversations about your personal life and what's going on in the classes. I definitely um, would echo everything Michaela said. And I also think it's really cool because personally for me, a lot of the academic advisors I had were went beyond the person that I was assigned. So like, for example, I was not like the the first academic professor I had was a dance professor uh, because I took a dance class. And so they were great and they helped me a lot with like theater classes and stuff. But or I like found a lot of other uh, academic mentors like um, 
through like my classes and things like that. So Professor Wolfman was my first year general chemistry teacher. And unfortunately he passed away and he's no longer with us, but he was one of the most incredible professors I've ever got the opportunity to learn from. Uh, he was one of the hardest professors I had, sure, but he really did care about his students and like really prepared you for the next few years that you were gonna have at BC. And he would have office hours and like, I got to meet with him outside of the office hours and really just gave good and honest advice about like where I should be thinking about for pre-medical, like for my pre-med career and things like that. And even like, for example, like, um, I was a research assistant in a psychology lab my freshman year and the first day I went up to like the professor's office and I heard her name and I was like oh this sounds oddly familiar she was published in my high school psychology textbook and I was like oh my god I'm fangirling like there's no way and so she, we ended up talking and she ended up becoming my mentor and like led me through my own research project so you're definitely able to find academic mentors even though even if they're not the ones that are assigned to you which I think is a really special um, experience at BC. Awesome. Um, maybe Nick can draw on this one. Um, someone's asking if you're an MCAS, is it easy to get a minor in CSOM? Yes, it is. Um, I have a minor in finance from CSOM. I think this is actually a fairly new addition that Boston College has done. Um, uh, you're allowed to minor in six different disciplines within CSOM. I think it's finance, accounting, marketing, finance and accounting for consulting and then there's two I'm probably missing but um you definitely are able to minor uh in Carroll if you're not in Carroll so I'm, I'm casting around and I'm minoring in Carroll and the workload is really uh not difficult at all the minors in Carroll are only six classes and for me especially there's a lot of overlap with e the econ uh cores that you take in the econ classes so um definitely minor in Carroll is something that's very popular nowadays and very doable as well Awesome. So this next one's a little general. Anyone can chime in, but what do you think is um, your favorite spot to work on campus um, to do some work or, you know, where do you think students would best flock to um, when they're on campus? I can start with that one. My favorite spot to study on campus is called the Stokes Bridge. Um, so there's Stokes South and Stokes North, which are uh, two of our most recent buildings that house a lot of our humanity course and there's a bridge that connects them and on the bridge there's like uh I guess like chairs with chairs with like kind of mini tables and there's like a big glass window where you can kind of see all of campus so it's a very scenic spot to you know read or get some work done between classes so that would be my favorite spot to study on campus. Um, I think for me, I am not a person to study in libraries. I think I've stepped in the library to like do printing and stuff, but after freshman year, I decided not to. I have um, ADHD, so I get very distracted very easily and being spaces like a library, although sometimes it can be normally quiet for me. I just like see people I know and then I, I can't focus and there's just a lot of people everywhere. Um, but the libraries are, um, you know, like we have O'Neill Library, which has five floors. So it really has like something for everybody um, on campus, which is something that I'm very grateful for because I'm not a library person. So even though there's a quiet floor in O'Neill or the whole Babs Library is quiet, I still decide not to go there. Rather, I do a lot of my studying um, in the green room, which is actually uh, where all the theater kids will kind of hang out um, before and after and during rehearsals and things like that. And so I kind of just sit there at one of the desks in there and do all of my work there. I got so comfortable there. I even have a blow up couch uh, with my name on it in there. So like really there are a whole bunch of different niche places you can find on campus besides the libraries if libraries aren't your thing. And if they are, that's totally cool. There are so many different types of libraries on campus. We have like five just on our main campus. So there really is something for everybody. And then also I really like to study in the classrooms, especially during final season. Um, so they'll open up the classrooms, I believe 24 seven. Um, now there's like certain protocols you have to follow with COVID, of course, but um, you can study in classrooms as long as they're not being used. And it's really nice because like, you can kind of like be in the space where you're taking the test or like, uh, you know, like if you just like to have a lot of space to spread out, like it's really, it's really um, great for that. I would have to say gas and quad. So gas and is our like main building on campus. Like beautiful if you guys look it up you can look up gas and grams on instagram um 
I am also not really a big library person, like Tiff said. So when it's really nice out, I try to go outside and sit outside in front of Gasson or within Gasson because there's a little library within there and it's super quiet and easy to study in. But I feel like I'm hustling and bustling throughout the day. And I know that um, during work, I actually get a lot of my work done and my work study job. So if there's any downtime when the office doesn't really need me, I'm just sitting there grinding, trying to get my homework done then. Um, and if not, I usually come back to my room and all the different um, dorms, they have lounges on each of the floors or a common lounge. So super easy if I want to go in my few days just to walk a couple steps over there. And they're usually always open. So I would either say gas and quad or at work or in the lounges in the dorms. Great. Um, Definitely agree with a lot of those different options. I find a different place every week because I can't concentrate in the same place uh, all the time. But um, Michaela kind of drew on this a little bit. What are some um, examples of work study options? And then Anya, maybe you can chime in. There is a prospective nursing student who um, is interested in a part-time job and was wondering how difficult it would be to kind of take on different extracurricular um, activities or a job as well. Um, I can talk about the work study. Uh, so that's been in my financial aid package for, I think, all my four years. Um, and so when freshman year, uh, they posted like the different opportunities that you can have for work study. So like you can work in the libraries, you can work um, in the dining halls, you can work um, in research uh, labs. Um, there are a few other places you can work on campus too that I'm uh, that are escaping my memory. You also have the opportunity to work at an off-campus work study. It has to meet certain requirements, um, and those are things you can find online, but if they do meet the requirements, you are able to apply through that, um, and you can have that off-campus job work uh, count as your work study. Um, but for me, I used, uh, I have two on-campus work study jobs. It was, I am currently a marketing assistant in the theater department, and then I was also a research assistant in the Cognitive and Effective Neuroscience Laboratory, which was really cool because I started just scanning in paper. I really, I went to them because I saw that they were listed. Um, freshman year, I said, hi, I like psychology. I need money. Is there anything you could do to help me out? And they said, yes. And so I got a job in that lab. I started scanning in papers, but I guess she thought I was reliable and then asked me to come on as an official research assistant. And then I ended up leading my own project. So there are a lot of opportunities on campus to have a work study. And if you want it to be geared academically, you can totally have it. Uh, be that as like a resource or just assistant or something, or if you have a passion for marketing, these some departments are offering marketing positions. Um, there's definitely something for everybody, I think. Um, also, like for certain positions and certain clubs can count as work study, like, or not as, I don't know if it's work study officially, but they will pay you. For example, like head coordinator of student submission program is able to uh, secure funding for that position. Also, I was the uh, previous vice president of the undergraduate government, Gianna is the incoming one. Um, and you're also able to get paid for that position as well. So there are, are opportunities on campus to be paid um, in a variety of different areas. Yeah, Tiff mentioned it. Um, research is a huge part too. You don't need to be work study to get research um, opportunities and also get paid for them. So when I'm conducting my research about tattoos in the sociology department, we have a certain amount of hours depending on how many people are working on the project at once and then we log those through an online um, system and then we get paid each week and then I have my job at one of the VP offices at Mission Ministry office and there's plenty of offices on CoRo that you can work. I know I've heard of my friends working for different deans or for conduct in different offices because all of those people have usually students working for them to greet people come in when they come in, file things, get coffee, um, do whatever needs to be done within the office. So definitely a lot of opportunities that are posted and also not posted. So you can like walk into somewhere and be like, do you have any opportunities? Because they didn't see that it was on, listed online and a lot of times they'll find a spot for you. So definitely something to look forward to and into. I can chime in. So many of our nursing students work um, and have part-time jobs. We offer work-study positions um, in the School of Nursing. I'm a good starting point for first-year students who are interested in work-study within the department. My email is on uh, part of my name, so feel free to reach out. Um, but in addition to that, we have uh, research as a paid opportunity that's not necessarily work study. After your sophomore, you complete your sophomore year curriculum in the School of Nursing, you are eligible uh, and qualified, licensed as a 
as a PCA. And so many students begin working in hospitals as uh, patient care assistants. Um, and as you go through clinical rotations, that also creates opportunities for students to stay on um, and pick up shifts um, at, at hospitals that they get paid for um, as a point of connection for uh, future work experience and things like that over the summer and, and during the academic year. So there are opportunities. Time management is important. And a lot of students really integrate um, their work experience to kind of gain more nursing skills and, and, and have it be a relationship that works that way. Great. Um, so I have another question here. I heard a lot of majors and minors thrown around in the intros, but either in your own experiences or just, um, you know, from what you've seen as a student, is double majoring common for a lot of students? And is it difficult to manage the workload with the social life and also extracurriculars if you choose to go that route? Yeah, I would say that it's pretty common, um, especially if you're going to have the credits a lot. I think of I don't know if it's just the people that I've chosen to surround myself with, but a lot of their mentalities have been like, if I'm going to take these classes anyways, might as well, you know, get credit for it on my degree, uh, which is why they end up picking up the double major or the minor. Um, and it's very easy because like if you, especially if you're taking classes like, uh, like in your freshman year that will double count towards like your core curriculum, like you're going to free up a lot of spaces pretty fast. Um, so I'd say that it's definitely easy. I mean, for me, it's been easy to have the major in the Morrissey College of Arts and Science and hold a minor in the Morrissey College of Arts and Sciences and a minor in the um, in the Carroll School of Management. Um, so it's definitely manageable. I will say time management is key. Like, of course, if you are going to make the choice to be able to you know, take on the academic workload, you just got to be prepared by, you know, staying on top of your work, not waiting to the last minute um, and making sure that you're able to get your stuff done. Uh, like, especially if you schedule your classes during the day, one of the hardest transitions for me was learning that, you know, like every time I have free time during the day, I can't just go back to my dorm and watch Netflix because I'm going to have rehearsal like later that night for five hours. So I'm going to have to use my time wisely. But honestly, as long as you use your time wisely, you will definitely, and of course, like leaving time for rest, like definitely take care of yourself first um, and, you know, make sure you are able to manage your time so that way you don't feel stressed. Um, you'll be able to have like also a social life and involve yourself in extracurriculars. I think everybody is very involved here at BC. So uh, that's very common uh, to like have extracurriculars and stuff after class. And so as long as you're keeping up with your academics and making sure that you're using your time wisely and, you know, like studying more than one day before the test, it, I definitely do think it's doable. Definitely. And I'm also double majoring and minoring and going abroad. So it definitely is you, everyone is capable, I think, of doing it. If you come in with AP credits, which we talked a little bit about before, um, you either need like a four or five, you can look it up like Boston College AP credits. And then when you come in with those, you don't necessarily get college credit. You test out of different core curriculum classes. So it opens up the opportunity to take more classes towards a double major or minor. For example, I came in with AP Euro credits. So that meant that I was already a step forward to get my history major. So you can work out things like that. And I think different majors, they have different um, number of credits and classes that you have to take. So if you take like a big class, like I think neuroscience is one of the big majors where it has a lot of different credits. So it might be harder for you to double major in that way or minor. It depends on like how much space you have in your schedule and how many credits you need for the specific major. But for me, it's been super doable. I've planned it out. I think I have two extra um, elective spots even with everything in there. Great. So I'm going to pick two questions and kind of sandwich them together, but there are some questions about living arrangements. So one, do you like your living arrangements um, so far? And um, two, how do you go about um, finding a roommate and finding what residential community you want to be a part of? I can start. I'm um, sorry, my Wi-Fi completely cut out, uh, which is why uh, I had to rejoin, hopefully. Uh, nothing happens anymore, but I can start with the like freshman year finding roommate and living learning community part of the question. So what's great is once you get accepted into Boston College, you're put in, you can join a class of 2025, class of 2026 Facebook group. And in that group, uh, there's potential to meet a lot of prospective roommates or friends. Um, most people like to share uh, their interests and you can kind of just reach out to other people who share similar interests, come from similar areas. Uh, so you can meet and potentially roommate with each other. Um, there's also the aspect of going random, which is what I did. Um, 
BC has this kind of survey matching system where you fill out a couple questions about whether you like to go to bed early, whether you like to have guests or not, and they'll do the best in your ability to match uh, you with um, a potential roommate. So the random roommate I got my freshman year, I'm still living now, my senior year. So it went well for me. And I think no matter which way you go, um, there's great stories of picking your roommates. There's great stories of going random. So uh, in that aspect, uh, I don't think it's something that's some uh, to get too stressed about in terms of living and learning community. So we have living and learning communities. And for freshmen, I think we have six specific living and learning communities. Um, so just to highlight, one of them is in Costco, which is uh, an all girls building uh, on upper campus. So that's one of our communities. We have a perspectives li living and learning community, which is for a perspectives course, which is a kind of similar to Pulse. It's a year long philosophy and theology course. And there's a living and learning community on Newton campus where you basically live with your class kind of. Um, I know uh, for sophomore year, there's a healthy living li uh, living and learning community. If you're um, like into eating healthily, living a healthy life, not into you know drinking and things on that aspect, you can be placed on a floor where it specifically caters to that interest. So there's so many different communities that you can request to join and be part of, which definitely help expedite your living situation at BC. Yeah, and then I think for other living arrangements, I've loved everywhere that I've lived um, so far. So freshman year, it's a lot of, it's all traditional housing. Uh, you can get a single if you have special accommodations or if you are one of the people who are randomly assigned a single, or you can be given a double uh, tr traditional triple, or you can have a lofted triple, uh, which is where, actually, no, there's no more lofted triples because of COVID. Um, and then there's the, the quad, which is where there's four people. Um, so all freshman year, it's all traditional, like typical dorm styles you would see. Um, and then the common bathroom is shared. Um, with like half of like half your floor is one bathroom, half the floor is the other one. I lived in Madeira, so mine was set up a little bit differently. Um, but that's how it works for freshman year. Sophomore year, you have the opportunity to um, start living in um, almost like apartment style or the sophomore year they're called suites because they don't have full kitchens yet. But if you are living, uh, if you are living in a suite style housing sophomore year, it's all on lower campus. Um, you can still live in traditional style housing sophomore year, but most of the sophomore class will end up being in suite styles and that's all on lower campus and that's where you'll have a common room um, with like two couches and then you'll have a kitchenette. Um, and then uh, you'll have like, I think it's like six, eight or nine mans. Um, and so the rooms, it's if it's a six man, it'll be like, I think three doubles, um, nine man, it'll be three triples. Um, and then um, I think, Oh, and then eight man, it'll just be two, it'll be four uh, doubles. And then you'll have like a bathroom, like two bathrooms for the whole suite. It's really nice. And then junior year, you can live in an apartment style, which is basically the same as the suite style, except you have a full kitchen and you don't have to be on the meal plan anymore. Um, and that's all on lower campus. And then also to Commonwealth Avenue, 2000 Commonwealth Avenue, which is just right down the road from here. Um, and there's buses that will provide you um, transportation to and from that as well. You could also live off campus. 50% of students get four years of housing of uh, four years of housing, and then the other 50% of students will get three years of housing. Um, and so those who don't get th four years of housing usually live off campus their junior year, and that's when people are going abroad. So it's easy like switch out on leases, things like that. If someone you know is staying in the fall and someone else is going in the spring, they can like take each other's place. So all the off-campus housing is in this area. It's very easy to get to. And then senior year, basically everybody will come back and live on campus their last year. And all senior housing options are apartment style housing. So uh, the coveted senior place to live are the mods. Um, and that's where like they have their own backyard, their own grill. It's like many houses on campus. And then the rest of the senior housing is also on lower. So it's really nice because I love how as my last year on campus, like everybody's kind of here with me before I like go off and be a real adult and live on my own for the first time. Um, and I really like that. And and I've lived with the same people for the next past uh, three years. Uh, I lived with them actually in Medeiros, uh, so four years total. Um, and it's been a really great experience and I've loved all of my roommates. Great, um, so we're gonna end off on a strong note and if all of you can give um, just a piece of advice to either your freshman yourselves um, that you wish you knew and Anya in your case to a freshman student, um, what would you say? start off. Um, I, I think the biggest piece of advice that I would 
give would be that there is no such thing as a silly question. And that seems simple, um, but it's it's harder to do once you're here. I see a lot of students and I, I was in those shoes myself a long time ago now, um, that you feel like you can't ask that, that you should know something. The truth is this is a new experience. You're in a, a period of transition and we don't expect you to know everything. And so ask about anything. That's what you're here for. You're here to learn, you're here to grow. And you can't do that in my opinion, if you're not willing to put yourself out there and ask some questions. And I think it can lead to great things. Um, so that's my piece. Yeah, for me, I would definitely say um, to try something new. Um, you know, college is one of the last times where you'll be able to you know, take classes and learn about things that aren't like specifically like what you're specializing in. Um, and I think that's just like a really beautiful thing. And especially at BC, they want you to become a well-rounded individual. So through the core curriculum, through extracurriculars and stuff, like you're going to have the opportunity to grow as a whole person and work on like aspects that like you didn't even know. Like, for example, like I never thought I would be like involved in campus politics and then here I was the vice president. So um, there are a lot of opportunities I would say, of course, like stay within reason, like don't over challenge yourself, but don't be afraid to try something new um, because you never know what good can come out of it. And if you don't end up liking it, at least you learned something about yourself um, is the way that I have looked at it. So definitely don't be afraid to take advantage of opportunities that BC will provide you with. Uh, similar to Tiff, if I had to give advice to my freshman year self, I would tell myself to uh, like put myself out there more. Um, I think my especially freshman fall, I was very, I guess, reserved and like I feared like being judged or like being embarrassed. So I would definitely recommend like putting myself out there, saying hi to all my floor mates all the time, joining uh, a lot of different clubs on campus. Um, I think one of my biggest regrets is that freshman fall is kind of like a lost semester like I didn't start doing that until like next the semester after which like was kind of a step behind so I would definitely say to like reach out if you have any interest in any different clubs to like reach out try to join one thing that um, everyone here can definitely echo is that everyone at BC wants to make it feel like a home wants to help you wants to be there for you so definitely uh, just don't be afraid of anything and uh, follow your heart I guess very cheesy I think I would tell myself not to think that college is going to be like a copy and paste of high school. I knew I came in trying to do the same extracurricular activities as I did in high school. I tried some out like I did the newspaper here when I did yearbook in high school. I did try it out and I realized that I was trying to copy and paste myself into college. I think it was a good experience to try it out, see if I did like it. But I wish I kind of like Nick kind of said, um, ventured out of my comfort zone and didn't just look for the things that I had already known. I know I'm still doing that, trying to join new clubs. I joined the Organization of Latin American Affairs this year. So I think even if you don't do something freshman year, don't think you're closed off for the rest of your four years. There's always a great time to explore and try things that you didn't even think about in high school. Yeah, for sure. I definitely agree with everyone. I'll just chime in and add my piece too. Like Tiff, um, I was never involved in you know my high school student government. I would have never thought that I would you know, also be EVP for the upcoming year. So definitely try new things, get out of your comfort zone. And I would also say, don't sweat the small stuff. You have a lot of ups and downs your freshman year. And I feel like I really focused on very small things that in hindsight don't really matter to me anymore. Um, you know, you're gonna make a lot of memories your freshman year and you're gonna remember a lot. And I promise the small stuff you're not gonna remember. So don't sweat it um, and enjoy the ride. Enjoy your journey um, because it it's gonna make you grow as a person. So. That's my two cents. But thank you so much, everyone, for joining our webinar. Thank you to all the panelists for being here. And um, we'll see you throughout the weekend.